Today's reading is taken from John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 8. The Empty Tomb 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Madeline went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived behind him and he went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been put round Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself and separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went in. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus.
the tomb is empty. There's no one there. We proclaim an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. And of course, this has been a reality for the past 2,000 years. Now we go through the drama of Holy Week on an annual basis, the ride into Jerusalem, culminating in the crucifixion, death and burial of Jesus. And then we celebrate the resurrection. The tomb is empty. Of course, I'm standing here today at some point in Holy Week because we pre-record. And today is not officially Easter Day. It's Good Friday, in fact. But hey, Jesus is still risen. And I'm excited about an empty tomb. And I hope it's not just on Easter Sunday that you are excited about an empty tomb, but every single day of your life. Well, Jesus rose from death 2,000 years ago and we proclaim the tomb that has been empty for 2,000 years. We can't even say exactly where that tomb is, at least with any certainty. Our theme picture for today well, it's two pictures. One is from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the church building that was built around the place where, in traditional thinking, Jesus was buried. And the place where he was buried is like a shrine inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, heavily adorned, but as a place. And the other part of the picture is door, which simply says, he is not here, for he is risen. And that's the door which adorns the garden tomb at a slightly different location, which has some relevance and truth about it. The hill nearby does look a little bit like Golgotha, even though it's a bus station at the moment. And this garden tomb is a delightful place to go because there are no adornments. It's quite English because it's run by an English charity and uh, lovely flower gardens and the hole in the rock. An empty tomb from which Jesus, our Saviour, became our life. And that tomb was given back to Joseph of Arimathea, who'd lent it, although he hadn't realised that he'd lent it. He thought he'd given it away. Here you are, Joseph. We don't need the tomb anymore. Great and powerful leaders have their tombs. Lenin rests preserved, displayed in his mausoleum. Mao as well. The Kims of North Korea. And daily people file past. The stuffed effigies of these people, for that's how I can only describe it the awfulness of trying to preserve a body after death to display. But I should add that there are one or two popes of the Catholic Church who also are on display in the same way. Our symbol, our Christian symbol, is the cross. A symbol of agony sorrow and death, a gruesome symbol, a structure, an apparatus of torture. 
onto which a human body was nailed and hoisted up. It was the worst torture of killing and I need not describe that in detail for we were there. You see, did you know that in coming to Christ you died with him and you rose with him? Did you know that in his death you were there and you were there in that empty tomb? He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins and he paid the price with his blood. Through his death I died to sin. And when he uttered those words, it is finished. That was a pivotal point in eternity. And on the third day, no stone could ever hold him. The cross is not the end. It is a memorial of redeeming love the price that Jesus paid. We don't place Jesus on the cross, although some Christian traditions do. But certainly in our tradition, we remember the cross because the cross too is empty. The Lord has risen again and he burst forth. And Jesus rose in a new body, a body made for eternity. To those who saw him, they recognised him, although some had difficulty recognising this Lord Jesus. They could see marks on his hands and the place where the spear went in his side but this body was completely healed it was completely refreshed and completely new fit for eternity the tomb is empty there is no need to seek the living among the dead there is no need to build a memorial to hold the physical remains of our Lord for there are none there are no cues about the place to look for remains because no remains exist so where is the body well we may forget that we the church are his body, his body that he bequeathed to us. He is the head and we are his body. Tongue can beat me then sleep on. 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. How poor thy look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sin the Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on Perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. Man with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my We have an Easter script used at church services around Easter time. It goes, the Lord is risen, to which people respond, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Now, it's not actually my favourite script, even though it's spoken all over the world. So who am I to make judgments like that? However, to me, it's not quite natural speech, certainly not in this context. The words, he is risen indeed, come from two unnamed disciples of Jesus who'd encountered the risen Lord and they didn't realise it was him. Somehow, they were prevented from recognising Jesus. They'd spent a few hours with him walking to a place called Emmaus and it was starting to get a little dark and the two disciples invited this gentleman they were walking with who was making as if to go further along the road to a meal and when he sat down to eat with them it was then they recognised who he actually was. He really is risen. Jesus then left them. They had had a realisation. It's him. He really has risen. Just like the others had said today. He is indeed risen. He truly has risen, which turns into our words, He is risen indeed. This would be my version if I was on the 
liturgical commission. Jesus is alive. He is alive today. Shall we try it? Jesus is alive. He is alive today. Is the